Good evening. Welcome to South Asia Newsline. I'm Akansha Parimu. At the top stories, we are tracking for you on Tuesday, the 24th of January. Indian Army displays Made in India weapons ahead of Republic Day Parade. Pakistan's Energy Minister seeks distribution line upgrade after major outage. And Sri Lanka hopeful of completing debt restructuring in six months, says Central Bank Chief. And now for all the details. The Indian Army on Tuesday showcased its weapon systems at the India Gate War Memorial in New Delhi, which will take part in the upcoming Republic Day Parade on 26th of January. The Army said in a statement, all the weapons and equipment are indigenously manufactured under the flagship Make in India initiative. Ahead of the 74th Republic Day celebrations, the Indian Army on Tuesday showcased the Made in India weapon systems, which will take part in the upcoming Republic Day Parade in capital New Delhi on January 26. The weapons included were BrahMos supersonic missile system, Nag anti-tank missile system, Akash air defense system, main battle tank Mark I Arjun, K-9 Howitzer and quick reaction fighting vehicles. These weapons reflect the country's vision of self-reliant India, an army official said. Apart from this, the Indian Army will also use 105 mm Indian field guns for the traditional 21-gun salute to the country's president on the Republic Day. It is an assault bridge uh, which can be laid in a matter of minutes during both day as well as night. It is mounted on Tatra high mobility vehicles which has a high uh, degree of cross-country mobility. Uh, the equipment is a huge step towards achieving self-reliance in uh, man defence manufacturing in our own country. A rehearsal parade was also staged on Tuesday. India won independence from the British rule on August 15, 1947. But it was not until January 26, 1950 that the nation declared itself a sovereign republic state with the adoption of its constitution. Since then, India displays its cultural diversity and military power in a grand parade in New Delhi. In news from Pakistan, a day after a massive power outage hit Pakistan, the country's energy minister on Tuesday blamed the worst power outage in months on a lack of investment in the network. The minister said the aid-dependent nation had learned lessons from the breakdown that left millions of people without electricity. Pakistan's Energy Minister Khurram Dastagir Khan on Tuesday blamed the worst power outage in months on a lack of investment in the network, saying the aid-dependent nation had learned lessons from the breakdown that left millions of people without electricity. The minister told reporters that like much of the national infrastructure, the power network desperately needs an upgrade. But funding has been patchy as Pakistan lurched from one IMF bailout to the next. All 1,112 grid stations were back online on Tuesday, officials said, while efforts were underway to fully restore power. The government has been able to do a lot of work with the government. We have learned a lot of work with the government. I will report a lot of time after the government. But the government has कि अब बिजली का निजाम मुकम्मल तौर पर बहाल है और उसकी हम निगरानी कर रहे हैं और इस बात को यकीनी बना रहे हैं कि ऐसा वाक्या इन्शाल्लाह अब दोबारा ना हो और वो जो इन्वेस्टमेंट समय करनी है ना सिर्फ लाइनें बिछाने में बल्कि उनकी सेफ्टी के लिए वो हम करें। The outage which began on Monday morning was the second major breakdown since October. Although millions of Pakistanis suffer partial blackouts almost daily, including scheduled load-shedding power outs aimed at conserving electricity. Pakistan has enough installed power capacity to meet demand, but it lacks resources to run its oil and gas-powered plants and the sector is so heavily in debt that it cannot afford to invest in infrastructure and power lines. Moving on. Months after floods hit Gilgit Baltistan, victims still await rehabilitation and relief package from the government. 
They have complained the region does not have proper drinking water or working dispensary to help the locals affected from floods of 2022. They have alleged discrimination and accused the government has turned a blind eye to their problems. Misery of illegally occupied territory of Gilgit Baltistan does not seem to end. Months after the region suffered unprecedented flooding, residents have complained the roads and bridges which had washed out during June-July last year have still not been repaired. With the onset of winter and snowfall in the region, locals say their hardship has increased while they have received no government relief or rehabilitation despite promises. The supplied water is also dirty and not suitable for use. But we are left with no choice, said one of the flood victims. He added that people are suffering from different health issues, but there are no medicines in dispensaries. Residents of Gilgit Baltistan have long complained of discrimination by Islamabad, accusing the Pakistan government of repeatedly turning a blind eye to their problems. They accuse Pakistan, which rules the region through a proxy, does not grant the locals any political rights and representation, but exploits the region and its resources. In news from Afghanistan, the U.S. State Department has said that Washington is reviewing its approach and engagement with the Taliban regime in the context of the slew of human rights violations taking place in Afghanistan. Spokesperson Ned Price said the U.S. is actively evaluating with its allies and partners to take the next appropriate steps towards it. The U.S. State Department spokesperson Ned Price on Monday said that Washington is reviewing its approach and engagement with the Taliban in context of many human rights violations that are taking place in Afghanistan under the atrocious regime. Ned Price, in a press briefing, underlined that the U.S. continues to be world's leading humanitarian provider, with about 1.1 billion U.S. dollars worth of humanitarian assistance to the Afghan people, but not to the Taliban or any entity purporting to represent or serve the government. This money is not flowing to or through the Taliban. Uh, it is uh, being administered by NGO partners on the ground, or I should say it has been administered by NGO partners on the ground. And I say has because of the challenge we're facing now. Uh, these draconian edicts on the part of the Taliban, including uh, an edict propagated on uh, Christmas Eve of last year that NGOs couldn't work with women, uh, had to work with men. Of course. Meanwhile, the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs in a report on Monday said that Afghanistan is facing an unprecedented humanitarian crisis with a very real risk of systematic collapse and human catastrophe. The report states that the humanitarian crisis is reversing many of the gains of the last 20 years, including women's rights, and 17 million people will face acute hunger in 2023, including 6 million people at emergency levels of food insecurity. No government has formally recognized the Taliban administration since it seized power in 2021, with some diplomats saying it must change course on women's rights. Many countries have expressed major concerns over most girls and women over the age of 12 being stopped from attending school or university. Sri Lanka's Central Bank Chief P. Nandalal Virasinghe said on Tuesday that the island nation is committed to meeting all its debt repayments and is hoping to complete debt restructuring negotiations in the next six months. He said there has been good progress with India already pledging financing assurances and the same is expected from China and Japan soon, which are the other bilateral creditors. 
Sri Lanka is committed to meeting all its debt repayments and is hoping to complete debt restructuring negotiations in the next six months, the country's central bank chief, P. Nandalal Virasinghe, said on Tuesday. There has been good progress this month with India already pledging financing assurances. We expect assurances from China and Japan soon, Virasinghe said at an event titled Economic Outlook 2023. The biggest uncertainty is the time frame for the debt restructuring. It is only after debt sustainability is assured can Sri Lanka return to a sustainable growth path, the Apex Bank chief said. Crisis hit Sri Lanka is racing to secure a $2.9 billion bailout from the International Monetary Fund but requires the backing of its bilateral creditors to reach a final agreement. The island nation of 22 million people has grappled with challenges during the past year, ranging from a shortage of foreign currency to runaway inflation and a steep recession, the worst ever crisis in over 70 years. Sri Lanka's National Consumer Price Index, however, eased year-on-year to 59.2% in December, after a 65% rise in November, data on Monday showed. Veera Singh said the inflation rate is expected to reach single digits by the end of 2023. Moving on, the Nepali Congress on Monday announced it will contest the upcoming presidential election in the country. In a meeting of office bearers held at party's chairman Sher Bahadur Deba's residence, Nepali Congress agreed to seek support from all parties in the parliament, including their former ally, Mayuvis Center. The largest party in Nepal's House of Representatives, Nepali Congress, has demanded the election for the office of president to be held as per schedule in February. The party is also looking at Prime Minister Pushpak Amal Dahal, to whom they gave the confidence vote to support the Congress candidate in the upcoming polls, reports suggest. Talking to reporters, Nepali Congress spokesperson Prakash Saran Mahat said during the recent meeting of party office bearers, it was discussed to coordinate and seek support from the parties in parliament in the party's bid for presidency. We will take support from the Maoist Center. Local media quoted Congress Deputy General Secretary Umakan Chaudhary as saying, Though chairman of Maoist Center, Prime Minister Dahal has maintained he wants a neutral candidate who can be elected unopposed. His alliance partner KP Sharma Oli's CPN UML wants the top office. The presidential election is scheduled to take place by 11th of February but if certain provisions of elections are amended as demanded by political parties, it can get delayed till March. A series of cultural shows in Srinagar city of India's Jammu and Kashmir this week drew a large number of art-loving youngsters despite cold weather. The event aimed to promote traditional Kashmiri music, dance and theatre performances with a modern twist. Take a look. A series of cultural shows organized in Srinagar city of India's Jammu and Kashmir this week drew a large number of art-loving youngsters. Organized by the All Jammu and Kashmir Folk Artist Association at Srinagar's Tagore Hall, the event featured music, dance and folk theatre performances. It aimed to promote the Kashmiri traditional art forms and entertain the locals as the valley is witnessing a harsh period of winter with no major art and cultural activities happening. I am where our band theatre Chakri hai, jaha maara bachanagma hai, jaha maare damali hai. Or un sab fanu ka taigur hal ke is hal mein sardiu mehtmaam karna ye badi baat hai. Kyunki jaha khizaa ka mousam chal raha hai, waha bahar aap dekh rahe hai, andar culture activities ka. तो बहुत अच्छा लगता है एक इंसान एक लड़का लड़की जो कश्मीर में बच्चे हैं सब को मौका मिलता है कुछ करने का अपना talent दिखाने का. तो बहुत अच्छा रहता है ये इससे प्रमोशन मिलती है। The main attraction of the event was the traditional Bhand Pathar theater, which combines satire, dance, and music to generate awareness on contemporary social, political, and religious issues. But due to technological advancements in the field of media, the art form slowly lost its relevance and audience. Well, that's all we have for you from South Asia this evening. 
Now our viewers can watch the show on SaudiAsianewsline.com. You can also visit us on Facebook.com slash SAsianewsline and follow us on Twitter at SAsianewsline. That's all in tonight's edition. We will see you same time tomorrow. Good night.